What's going on, everybody? This is Kyle Hunter. I'd like to welcome you back to the Diagnosis Success Podcast, where we talk about motivation, inspiration, dedication. And as always, we just like to highlight the leaders at the forefront of their respective industries. And it's always a pleasure when we have those people with us, because as always, they drop gems, knowledge, and things that you can utilize in your respective career. And today we are very, very, very excited because we have a very, very special guest with us today. Uh, this individual is just a trailblazer. Uh, she is amazing at everything that she touches. And we are talking about no other than Stacy Bedford. How's it going, Stacy? What an intro. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me on the show today. Absolutely. No problem. Well, thank you for taking the time to, uh, to be with us today. And um, our podcast like is, is very focused around well two things the first thing is like just uh motivational content and the second component is musicians so uh we have a lot of musicians that listen to the podcast so i think this will be a great episode so once again thank you appreciate it my pleasure all right so we're gonna get started um the first question that i have for you stacy um i know a lot of times in life like people they they kind of like fast forward when they look at people that are successful so they see them in their current state but um they really don't know necessarily about their journey that they've been to that brought them to that point so for people that may not be familiar with you could you just kind of talk about your upbringing and um you know just kind of how that came to be absolutely um i think a foundation is so important and it really leads you to where you where you are um, so it's nice to not skip over those, <laughs> uh, those details. So um, I grew up on the South Shore of Montreal in Canada. Um, this is going to date me, but I still remember when my, when my dad brought home my first computer, which was a 486. And wow. I quickly broke it. <laughs> I was quite young. I think I was around eight years old, but I was so curious about that thing. Um, so I, I, at a young age, I went deep into teaching myself all about DOS commands, and that really spiraled throughout my youth into high school when I took some advanced HTML courses, Photoshop, at the time, Flash, Macromedia Flash, Illustrator oh, wow. courses. Flash. Yeah, so I acquired like a really broad knowledge of all things computers um, from that, uh, I guess, defining moment. Um, and then when I went into CEGEP, which is uh, the equivalent of college in Quebec, um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I was the type of person that I wanted to cover all my bases. I had a lot of drive. So I, I looked into, um, I wanted to keep my options open. So I, I basically just took enough courses to be able to build an art portfolio in all of my, all of my math courses. I wanted to keep my options open. So I figured out what university programs might need and I worked hard to ace all of those. Um, so <laughs> um, in my personal life at the time, uh, family gatherings always involved music. My early years, my teens, uh, I picked up my uncle's 12 string guitar and uh, I still remember that. I, I immediately started saving for my own. <laughs> so um, I ended up taking lessons with, uh, with an old family friend and that was an important time because he was a busker. He bust. Uh, he was like this incredible artist, but he bought it, like his main source of revenue was he bust in the metro stations. Um, he had he had like a, a an interest in classic rock. So my earliest influences were Fleetwood Mac, Deep Purple, The Eagles. Uh, not not things that a lot of uh, twelve year olds are <laughs> exposed to. I, I could play them on guitar. So I think that all of my friends uh, at the time were in bands, but. On my side, I was always really interested in being a spectator, supporting my friends who were artists, and just really helping in more of a grassroots way at the time. Um, that involved like hand-drawn poster art. It was a long time ago. So like I said, it was all pretty grassroots. Um, and throughout my youth, from Thursday to Sunday, I would be at live music events that whole, every single night. Um, so later, a little later on, <laughs> fast forward to, um, to university, I moved to Ottawa um, for university. And uh, I guess like all of those, I had a lot of interests and I've always been really, really, um, I, I'm a busybody, to be honest. I have a lot of hobbies and interests and I took a serious interest in environmental economics. Um, and I was also a good time girl. <laughs> I liked to have fun. I took, uh, I did bartending throughout university. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in 
in like music venues, Zafod's, Barry Moore is just soaking up all of the local talent. Um, and after university, I got my real estate license. Um, so I had a bachelor's degree in economics, this wide berth of hobbies and, um, and like my real estate license and my bachelor's degree. I spent, uh, during that time, I spent a lot of time working in property management and residential real estate sales. And I think what I took from that experience was it was a very successful time, um, but I realized that what I loved about it was just helping people. And I got some really great life experience during that time. I, I also realized that people will often tell you what they want with, and what they actually need can be two very different things. Um, so when you're working with people, ultimately your job is to make them happy and help them make good choices. And that's more important than anything. So I guess that's everything that happened before my life at Banzugal. Wow. That, well, that is a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. And, um, you know, I guess the thing that intrigues me and I like about that is that you've had so many different life experiences in different aspects. So sometimes I think like the most successful people, like our career paths aren't always like a straight path. You know, it's more like mm -hmm. zigzag, zigzag, you know, you get some experience over here, some there, and it's a culmination, you know? It's yeah, and those skills that you get from your different interests can be really transferable to what you do ultimately. And all of that experience can help you be more successful in business. Definitely, definitely. And that's important too, you know. And I think something that you said too that I want to piggyback off of is, is how you were able to navigate as far as with people. Like a lot of times verbally, they'll say one thing, but then it's something else. So it's like, you know, learning those little nuances and how to navigate that can actually make the difference between something being successful and then something actually not. So, I mean, that's pretty dope. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's pretty dope. Cool. Wow. Um, let me see. Did, well, you know, I had another question I just wanted to ask you, because I know that you said you talked about real estate. Were you around for like the subprime market when that hit and everything like that? Or no, you were kind of out of it by that time? Or, you know, and if you were, what was your experience during that time? It's an interesting question because I'm in Canada. So although like we in Canada, there's a lot of policies that uh, really protected um, consume like housing, uh, the housing market from making those choices, but we definitely were impacted by it. Um, wow. so yeah, so there was definitely, uh, like Canada kind of when that happened in the U S, uh, like really, in, um, Canada made a big effort to, uh, increase regulations and just, uh, like change the basis for what people needed to be able to buy a house. So even if the, the rates were low, they had to qualify so that, um, the rates were uh, like, as, as though the rates were higher. So, um, it really shielded us from a lot of the devastating effects of the subprime mor mortgage crisis in the, in the U S but we weren't immune to it. <laughs> Wow. Well, that's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, you you know, you guys, you're ahead of the curve. I mean, I'm not even going to talk about health insurance. That's a whole nother, other <laughs> you know, we're not going to get into that. <laughs> but, uh, but that's, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right. So um, another question that I had for you. Um, well, I mean, you pretty much, you talked about your journey up to Banzugal. So can you, well, for starters, for people that are not familiar with Banzugal, can you explain exactly what Banzugal is? And then we could kind of transition to how you came to be where you're at right now. Definitely. Um, so Banzugal, we're basically the most effective platform for musicians to build a website and manage their direct to farm, uh, direct to fan market and sales. Uh, it's Banzugal is an all in one platform and we offer musicians powerful design options. Uh, we're one of the only commission free uh, music and merch uh, store options for artists. Specifically, um, we provide mailing list management, detailed analytics, integrations with social networks, and more. Um, it's free to try Banzugal, um, and our plans range from $9 to $20 a month, depending on what your needs are. Wow. Wow, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and I know, you know, a lot of musicians, they can definitely benefit from that because um, so many artists that listen to this podcast, they always say, they just want structure for their career. Like it could be so all over the place. A lot of them are independent musicians. They're working full-time jobs, trying to make that transition to become a full-time musician if it's possible. So to have that structure where they can actually make it easier, you know? Yeah, and it's uh, it can be pretty simple to start. Um, 
I, I talked about transferable skills, but I'm a mother of three. And uh, if you want to set your kids up for success, you give them structure and they find comfort in that and it gives them confidence. So I would echo what you said. Um, when you're thinking about your business, it's a, it's great to have a, a strong foundation built on some structure and planning. Definitely, definitely. My daughter, she just turned nine years old and structure is the key word. So happiness, structure <laughs> equals happiness. Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, sometimes they might fight, but structure ultimately, like you said, they need that because it sets them on that path. And mm -hmm. even as they navigate through life, just having structure, how to plan your day, how to compartmentalize certain components of your day. So it's more progressive and, you know, you're just able to make progress. So I agree mm -hmm. 110%. Um, so as far as how you came to be at Bandzoogle, can you talk about how you, you actually navigated and, and eventually became where you are with the company? Yeah, definitely. Um, around the time I was working in real estate, I was a property manager for a busy, a busy real estate office. Um, I man, I was the office manager. I played a lot of roles in that company. Um, at the time, my brother-in-law was in a popular rock band called Rubberman. They were on like Conan O'Brien's top college bands. They're they're wow. quite big. They had music. They had music videos out on national television, and like many bands, <laughs> the group eventually disbanded. Mm -hmm. um, Chris continued to work at um, at the record label, and he uh, his like the record label they were signed to, and he. Um, he took on a job and this was back in 2003 Benzigal's old we're about 18 years old so he took on a job at the record label it was Aquarius Records and his job was to um, build and maintain websites for all of the artists on that label um, as it started to grow um, it was Chris and one developer at the time who started Benzigal um, they started like it just became too busy for them to take on like update websites were becoming important at that time back in 2003 and it was like way too much work for one person to constantly be updating like all of those things on the site so he created a simple control panel where artists could log in um, while they're on tour from any location and update their websites without any coding skills or design skills um, so uh, as Benzugal started to grow Chris needed someone to help him with tech support um, he knew that I had like people skills and that I had some transferable skills um, and um, I had ex I had a lot of experience with managing people, a broad knowledge of all things technical from my time breaking computers when I was quite young. Um, and then I had a genuine, all consuming love of music. So it was really a perfect fit. Um, so I joined the, the Bandsicle team with Colin and Eli. Um, and I like to say that the band is still together because we're all still working at Bandsicle. And that's almost 15 years later. Um, wow. Yeah, at the time we only had about 6,000 customers and it was enough to support a couple of developers, the founder and me. And I took a really hands-on approach to customer service. Um, so my start in music tech was really uh, all consuming. We had, uh, we had to go through, uh, I had to go through every new si sign up to Benzoogle every single day and figure out what opportunities they were missing out on with their web presence and I would coach them. So I kind of developed this training process for artists during my time in customer service. Mm -hmm. And that was really the basis of our customer service. And we maintain those values today. We have grown about 10 times in size since that started um, in customers and staff. And we still maintain wow. that really hands-on approach. Um, yeah. So that that was how I started. I, uh, I had a pretty interesting trajectory after that. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that well, that's amazing because I, I I know that you said six thousand when you started. So you said ten times. So you guys are about at like sixty thousand right now. Like, yeah, we have uh, sixty thousand active members right wow, now. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That is really yeah. amazing. You know, and, and I think about that, thirty staff over all over the world. Wow, and I you know I think that speaks volume to your business model too because the fact that you're able to have that growth over time that hands-on approach, like there's no substitute for that. It's like people, they know and they can feel when they're actually getting great service from a company. So, I mean, that's awesome. That's yeah, great. it's been really nice to be able to maintain like this, like family, small, small company approach, but continue to scale and grow. Um, it's been, it's been a really nice place to work in that kind of environment. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I remember um, when I was, getting started in the music industry at a young age and coding was so complicated 
And I remember like, you know, there, there weren't like platforms like, like Banzoogle, there weren't like, um, you know, I'm aging myself, but I'm an eighties baby. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, it's like, it was just so complicated. And I remember like me and uh, one of my, my friends from a while ago, we tried to start up a website and um, he would get so frustrated. Like he would just slam the keyboard, like, I hate this. And he's trying to do the coding. And I'm like, this is just way too complicated. You know, so I yeah. mean, you know, it your your platform is like perfect for artists because it, it just simplifies it. It takes the um the challenges out of it and makes something more practical. So I mean, kudos to you guys. You know, that that's awesome. Thank yeah. you. It's a it's interesting because um when the pandemic hit, a lot of artists had to move online uh when they didn't focus, maybe didn't focus a lot of their business strategies that way before, especially older artists. So I'm always so proud because I find uh, Benzigal customers who are like 80 year old jazz gurus and they've moved their business online and they're able to continue teaching online and with our tools. Um, originally, uh, when Benzigal started out, our, our uh, slogan was so easy your drummer can do it. Um, <laughs> so we maintain that uh, that uh, level of ease of use through the time with the, the new tools we've added. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Yeah, that, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, you know, I'm pretty sure all the uh, musicians that listen to the podcast, they're definitely going to look into it, you know, so that's that's awesome. Um, let's see, another question that I have for you. So, you know, being a CEO, I'm pretty sure that you've had obstacles that you had to overcome. Um, could you talk about, uh, I guess, what would you consider? Because I know there's always trials that come but can you talk about maybe one that stands out in particular that was very challenging for you guys as a company and that you you guys overcame? Definitely, um, especially when we talk about my, traje- my career trajectory, because I started out as really a frontline support person mm-hmm. and now I'm, now I'm the CEO at Benzoogle. Um, so I definitely had to overcome some challenges along the way um, and growing in business uh, can be challenging. As a woman, it's it's quite unique. (laughs) Um, yeah, I will say like, I can be pretty informal. Um, and my team definitely appreciates that about me. We have this environment where, where we have a very structured approach and structured operations, and we have really efficient ways of communicating and working together, but I really don't subscribe to any conventional or traditional business dealings in many other ways. Um, and I think because of that style, I had to work a lot harder um, as I climbed the ladder, um, and just prove that like serious and stuffy doesn't mean any less effective. Um, like I quite literally wear this personality on my sleeve. My hair is purple more often than not. I'm the only young female in a room of like older white men. And I guess like now that I'm here, I like to be an example of how you don't have to subscribe to a really rigid persona to lead a company. Like, I think that representation is really important for women in business, but anyone, um, and, um, yeah, one of my proudest parenting moments, bringing it back to that is, uh, a teacher said that my youngest was a nonconformist and I was like, that was the best compliment you could give someone, you know, <laughs> yeah. just let, yeah. letting people to be proud and confident with who they are and, uh, that you can move along that way. Yeah, that's true. It's like, thinking outside the box and daring to be different. Like, it's okay. You know, like, you know, that's what I, I noticed, like before I saw your purple hair and I was like, yeah, she's a rebel, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, because everybody feels like they have to be the same. Like everything is so cookie cutter in everybody's approach. So it's good to, to think outside the box and be different, you know, and mm-hmm. challenge the norm. Like, you know, the norm is boring. So it's like, be different, you know? Yeah. And you can be successful. And I think that it's good that there's exactly examples of that and they're emerging and um, people can identify and say uh, she's doing it like I could Mm. do that you know of course of course yeah definitely definitely Um, another uh, question that I had um, as far as like I know Banzoogle is a a power player you guys are doing great things Um, is there like one accomplishment that stands out the most to you or even if you got a handful which ones would you would you say were like really stand out where you're like yes like we're doing it um, yes. Uh, well, this year we hit $82 million in commission-free sales. Like our, our customers have sold 83, uh, $83 million in like, uh, music, merch, uh, virtual and, uh, live streaming, uh, and tickets, um, 
basically uh, our customers have been able to uh, continue to thrive during the pandemic. And that really escalated, like the, uh, the number of commission-free sales really escalated during the pandemic, which was really our goal. So that was one very proud moment. Um, in terms of strengths, I would say that Benzugal is great at adaptability and inclusiveness. Um, the music industry is changing so fast in every aspect, like what, what artists need to have an online presence, what technologies are available, and even infrastructure, the, the whole internet, and the availability. So um, I would say Benzugal has legs um, because we're always evolving to meet those needs of artists. And um, my next point was inclusiveness. And I think that's been a huge strength at Benzugal because we're artists ourselves. Most of the people who work at Benzugal are musicians. And we make sure that anyone in the company who is interested can have input into all parts of the projects from communications to product updates. Um, you'll hear, like, for example, you'll hear expert advice from on our blog from Adam, who is a support manager, and he's been involved in engineering products with art uh, projects with artists like Biff Naked, Econo Line Crush. And then there's Luis on the support team, who is like an incredibly talented drummer from South America. And he, he will jump into a product meeting and say, hey, like as a musician, I want to use this new tool we're building and this is how I would use it. So mm -hmm. the result on the business side is really tenfold. Our, our staff knows they're valued, they're included, they're more productive, and um, they put a lot of care into the work because of that. Uh, and our, our, our customers feel that um, all, the way, uh, all the way down. So um, more like... We're, we're basically building tools that we would use as artists ourselves and our team is very happy. So I would say that those are our strengths. That's amazing. That's amazing. And for people to be happy too. I think that's key. Like <clears throat> a lot of people, like they'll work uh, jobs for basically the point of survival. So it's like, all right, I need to go to work. I need to get a paycheck. But that's one thing that we um we emphasize on the podcast is to truly be happy and feel fulfilled, you know? So to actually have a work environment where everyone's thriving. And like you said, it's inclusive, it's empowering and everyone has a voice. That's important too. So, I mean, it's, Ben's Google is like the place to be. It's like, <laughs> That's awesome. That, that's really awesome. That's great. That's great. Um, another question I had for you, for musicians um, listening, I think that you, you've already provided a lot of valuable gems and tips, but um, if you can highlight maybe one or two things that you think are key for musicians to succeed in this present landscape, what would you say that those things are? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I would say it's, and this is not self-serving, but I would say that it's never too soon to register your own domain. It's part of your brand. The sooner you can establish a professional online presence, the sooner you can start booking gigs, selling music and merch, crunching data to help you make informed business decisions. Um, optimize your search engine game. It's a bit like your credit score. The longer you have it and all other variables aside, the better your position. Um, so, uh, I would say we have members who are really high ranking for things like Vancouver wedding band, and that's gold in your music business. So those things are really important. Um, Bill, I would say like on the social side, building out your network is so important in music. Uh, you never know who you're talking to and where they might be down the road. So whether that's virtually or like on the ground, it's really important to form connections early on. Um, take good notes about who you meet and why, where you met them. Uh, consider this like uh, part of part of your business um, uh, contacts. And um, I would say a growing network, it's likely to create a lot of more opportunities for you later on. True. That, that is very true. And uh, one thing I always say too is collaboration is greater than competition. So being able to teamwork and network yes. with people, you know, that like that's so, I feel like it's, um, it's something that's not explored enough because a lot of times musicians, they view each other as competition. So it's like, you know, oh, you know, I want this gig or I'm gonna hold this for myself, but knowledge is power. So if you network and you build with people and you can find out, well, hey, this person has a relationship with this music supervisor. Maybe we can get some music in this TV sitcom or this musician has a plug with a promoter and uh, let's say Italy, you know, we could do some shows out there. So networking, it really just, 
increases your opportunity. So yes, you know. Yeah, and you can never go wrong when you're choosing the kindest approach. Um, that's going to come back and help you later, uh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, mo most definitely, most definitely. All right, moving right along. I mean, you got so many gyms. I feel like you know, it's like a jewelry store. The gyms. <laughs> We're doing good here. <laughs> Another question I have for you, I wanted to ask you. So we ask every guest on the podcast this question, and um, it's about mantras. So my personal mantra is persistence wears down resistance. So no matter what the obstacle is or the challenge, like we just forge ahead and we'll, we'll always come out on top. So what is a mantra that you have that you've lived by that constantly keeps you going? This is a very easy question for me to answer because it's always in my head and it's you're responsible for your own happiness. And wow. we talked about that. Yeah, we talked about that a couple of times. We touched on it yeah. throughout this, this conversation, but um, it's really important. Your attitude is so important um, in any situation in life, in business. Um, in any situation, if something is off-putting or causing you to feel upset, you have the power to decide on your perspective. And that's internal. It's not a result of what's happening around you. So I would say be aware um, of the angle you're choosing more often than not, and always make a plan on what you can do to improve your situation or the situation of others. Um, mm. and focusing that and putting energy into your happiness will have like a waterfall, like a cascading effect on everything you do. Wow. That that's powerful. And like you said, to your point, it's, you know, it's synchronicity. Like we've just been talking about happiness, like this podcast. So I hope for all the listeners out there that you really take heed to that and just implement that in your day to day, you know, like do a self-assessment is the thing they call the, the self-check-in. So it's like, you know, maybe at the end of every day before you go to bed, if you just kind of just sit and you recap the daily events and how do you feel and why do you feel that way? And if you felt good, then continue to do those things that make you feel good. If you felt a little bad, you know, down and out, then figure out those things that are like, you know, we call them um, emotional vampires, right? Mm -hmm. Like what are the things that are draining you on a consistent basis and how can you turn that around? So you know, it's important. Do that self-checking because we're creatives, we're talented, but at the same time, we got to focus on our mental and emotional state too, because that affects our, our level of creativity. So, you know, great point. Great point. Um, if you had the power to change one thing about the music business, what would it be and why? Or do we need another hour? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll just fill it down into a couple of things. I think that like... Okay. I think to be honest, I'd say that historically artists have lost a lot of money. Um, and that is like, like a lot of it is related to, um, how they position themselves and also like how they catalog and store their musical works. If you're, if your work isn't properly copyrighted, if the materials aren't, are, are used without compensation or agreement, um, you're going to be, this is, this is a problem in the music industry. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that it's so complicated. Um, like it's, I was talking to Dave Kuhl, our Veep, uh, our Veep <laughs> this morning, and like, it's just, everything is so overly complicated for artists. It's no wonder that artists are struggling to find out where all of the revenue streams are available to them. So I wish like, I wish things like more supervisors would go directly to indie artists. I think there's a huge opportunity there for supervisors too. Um, I think that, um, like I was talking to Rain Maida from Our Lady Peace the other day, and he said that Chantal Kravyasik, his wife was commissioned to write the, like the ending score for La La Land. Mm -hmm. And recently she was watching, she was watching TV and some insurance commercial came up using her music. This stuff happens all the time. So like who dictates the rights to that music? Did the insurance company have a contract? It's so complicated. How much do you follow up with those leads? Like, will it be worth it in the end? It's very expensive. Mm -hmm. So this is what, like, these are just issues that artists have to raise, uh, have to face from like in their everyday lives. So like which <clears throat> revenue streams are available to you as a music creator, who's using those, like, how do you keep track of things? And then how do you register your, your music properly? So those things can be quite, 
quite complicated for artists. And if I had the power <laughs> to change anything, yeah. I would really simplify that process. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100% on that. And, and like you said, too, I think for musicians, which we always emphasize, is the power of ownership. But in addition to the power of ownership, how you utilize that ownership. Because if you're granting rights to your music, but you're not fully understanding uh, the the conditions or the terms that you're signing, you know, if, if you're signing on and someone says, hey, well, you know, because you sign with us, as many people can use your music as they want for a blanket price, well, that complicates things because, you know, as opposed to, let's say a music supervisor reaching out to a musician and saying, hey, you know what, I wanna pay you, $5,000 to use this song for this purpose. You know, now it's like you're being compensated in a different way as opposed to a blanket license where you're not really reaping the benefits as much as that song is being used. And like you said, if an artist is just sitting there in front of the TV and they see their song being played, it's like, this is news to me. And how much did I get compensated? You know, like this is yeah. kind of like the twilight and that's zone. Like, that's a very public forum. Like how often is that happening? Um, like, you know, I, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, yeah. So for all the uh, musicians, like we always say, you know, just be mindful, <laughs> you know, be mindful, be cognizant of what's happening with your music and how it's being utilized. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so another question I have here is um, if you could go back in time, right, we call this the, uh, the back to the future question, like Marty and the <laughs> DeLorean. <laughs> if you could go back in time and uh, you could just meet up with your younger self what advice would you give to your younger self um I would say I would say I would tell myself that it's okay to be bold I think like I think women are off will often second guess themselves when being put like when they're trying to put weight behind an idea or a meaningful conversation in any situation mm -hmm. and of course, there's a way to do that gracefully, um, but I would tell myself not to worry so much and that my ideas are valid. I've become a lot more confident in my experience over the years and just where I've ended up. Um, but I would say uh, I would tell my younger self to just go for it. That's some great advice. That's some great advice. And I'm just kind of piggybacking off of what you said, because we know how hard and challenging it could be for uh, for women within business um just as far as those challenges like um how how are you able to, to navigate it so well it seems like you know you're able to to just retain your composure um you know who you are you know what you're representing so i mean have you found it like sometimes maybe you would have to give advice to other women in a similar position that are in a position of power that may not necessarily feel like they get the respect that they deserve like you know, I think that people can get tripped up when they're especially anybody, not just women. I think that when you're in a conversation and you want your ideas or your value to be heard, that you can get really tripped up on uh, like the mood and the vibe and like you could focus maybe on the wrong things in those conversations. So I would say like continue to ask yourself in any of those situations, what am I trying to accomplish? And then focus on your goal. Don't focus on all of the other noise that could trip you up or like maybe negative ideas that are coming in your head or like concerns about um, about who you are as a person compared to everybody else in the room. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's important to really uh, focus on the goal and how you could add value to that goal. And if you continue to do that, you're going to be pretty successful. Definitely. Definitely. And I like what you said. It's like kill the noise, right? Kill the noise. It's, it's just noise, like it's just noise, it's a distraction, and it's not going to contribute to anything progressive. So it's like kind of, you know, I mean, we all get thrown off our square every now and then, you mm -hmm. know, it's like Mike Tyson said, you know, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? So, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you, you got your plan, but then the noise comes, so it's like you got to maintain your composure, you know, regather yourself, so... Yeah. yeah. And it's okay to be upset about things, but um, it's not okay to act unprofessionally on those things. So, you know, like keep a, keep a leash on yourself and like, um, and just be confident. Definitely. Most definitely. I, I agree with you. I agree. Um, 
I wanted to ask you, like, as far as like, because we spoke about this, uh, we touched on it briefly, but um, to dig a little deeper, where do you see the direction of music headed within the next 10 years? And um, what would you suggest like musicians do as far as moving forward? This is a good question. Um, I see, um, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. I see that I think we're going to see a rise in things like the cost of streaming services to the end user for services like Spotify, um, more fair payouts to artists. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is a pipe dream. I think that it's all really about the availability of direct defend artist tools and the pressure that that's putting on like these big box services that are taking such a big pie of independent artists. So just really the availability and the rise of subscription as a service based businesses um, over time, more techies are building self-serve tools to help people, artists, solve problems. Mm -hmm. um, what once required like a huge amount of people power to accomplish, um, now artists can do with limited resources of time and money. One person can do a lot of those things by themselves. Before that might have required a full team, but now they don't have to. Um, they can go, they can, there's enough direct defend tools. So I think that's going to put pressure at the top level. Um, and you're going to see more, more equity and like more fair payment distributions as a result. Um, yeah, that would be my, that would be my very optimistic crystal ball moment. <laughs> yeah. That, well, look, we're all optimistic. We, we hope that that, uh, that comes to fruition. Cause when I look at the payouts, uh, for a lot of musicians, for the streaming revenue and things like that. It takes so many streams, as you know, just for artists to see a decent or fair compensation. So, you know, that that would be a great thing. Hopefully, you know, that day comes to pass, you know. So so we, we shall see. Um, I want to ask you what new and exciting things are on the horizon for Banzoogle? Um, I know you guys are doing big things, great things as always. Um, so what what can we expect? Well, we've been really focusing, like I said, on our um, just helping artists make more money, especially during the pandemic and repositioning our tools and putting them into the context of uh, artists earning money during a pandemic. This continues to be an ongoing problem. We're smack in the middle of the fourth wave right now. And what, what your feelings are about, like the policies around shutdowns and touring, it doesn't really matter. What matters is like how we deal with those. So Benzoogle continues to push out tools to, um, to help artists make money during this time. One thing that we have coming is landing pages. So pro members at Benzoogle will be able to create landing pages um, within their sites uh, for things that are like for dedicated promotional purposes, like album or single launches, podcast or personal projects, or for special product offerings or services. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a new tool. It'll allow artists, our members to keep a focus on lead generation or even test out ideas and messaging before launching things. Um, and it'll include future updates for this will include things like content templates, I don't know, like a lot of people don't know what they should put on a landing page. So we're going to help uh, you with that. And also reporting. It's going to be a massively useful tool for uh, for marketing your projects and your services as an artist. Um, and the landing pages will work with all of our existing features. So you could add like a mailing list sign up form, any e-commerce features, music players, album art, galleries, blog, podcast, tip jar, subscriptions and all of those things that we already offer. Uh, wow. So that's a big thing that we have coming. Um, and uh, we're also about to add a PayPal integration for all of our existing e-commerce tools. And of course, more themes. Our designers are like amazing and they're so, they're so great about closely following color trends and design trends and just like new technologies available for design. So you can expect us to push out like dozens of new themes every year. That's amazing. That is amazing. Well, I'm pretty sure like, you know, a lot of musicians will definitely take advantage of that. And um, I just had two more questions for you. Um, and they're pretty, pretty basic. So for artists that want to want to sign up with Banzoogle, what's the process? Any musician who's listening to this podcast right now says, wow, I like that. I want to get involved. Like, what's the next step? What should they do? All they have to do is go to benzoogle.com and we have a 30 day free trial. You don't have to enter like payment information. There's no strings attached. You can try Benzoogle for free for 30 days. And if, um, 
if if you like it, you can you can uh, upgrade to a subscription. And there's several, like I said, several payment options. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. So for all the uh, the musicians out there, you know, take note. Uh, definitely go check it out. And uh, and then the last question: If someone wants to actually even work for Banzool and work for you guys, who's listening to this podcast, and they says, "Well, you know, I I feel like I'm I'm able to do or fill a void that they may have." What are the steps for that? Like, how can they find out if you guys are even hiring? We have a, on Benzigal.com, we have a jobs page. So anytime we're hiring, we'll post, we'll post on there. And it's a very clear application process. We love to hire our members. Um, so oftentimes, if you're trying out Benzigal, you get to know somebody in one of our community forums. Um, maybe they're going to be helping you later on <laughs> with your website <laughs> construction. So we love to hire our customers because they understand our product. And like I said, we're artists. We're a team of artists helping artists. That's super dope. That's super dope. So if anybody listening that's interested in joining the team, uh, definitely check out the site as well. So this was a, a great, great interview. I feel like um, we covered every, like we checked off all the boxes, right? Like we checked off music business. We checked off um, just artistry. We checked off mental health. We checked off emotional health and just making sure that, that your happiness is always at the forefront. So uh Wow, this is a great interview. We just appreciate your time. Thanks for everything. Thank you so much. It was really nice speaking with you today. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So uh, yeah, once again, this is uh, Kyle Hunter with the Diagnosis Success Podcast. We thank you all, all our faithful listeners for listening once again. And as always, just continue to push for success, push for excellence and happiness. Take care.